Nancy Merrill, and I ask a lot of questions to find out what really goes on in the minds of millionaires. world-famous American architect, Marshall Stradala. He's working as the chief architect of the Shanghai Tower, which, upon its completion in 2014, will be the tallest building in China. First of all, it's never been done before, so everybody's a little nervous. Can we really make this work? And there's all kinds of very weird things that happen with a tall building. There's, there's always two things going on. If you could do two things, you could make it aesthetic and make it performance, then it gets built. Shanghai has the reputation of a modern international city, and in the past 20 years, many architects have come here and contributed to the beautiful skyline. Marshall, this is a great pleasure to meet you. Well, thank you for having me. I feel honored. To... <laughs> well, you're, I'm the one that's honored. I mean, I, I have read so much about you, um, and not the least of which is you are considered one of the handful of architects in the world. Um, who has accomplished uh, this extraordinary feat of building some of the tallest buildings in the world. And specifically, you are building the Shanghai Tower. Well, well technically, I'm not building it. Well, I'm, I, I'm an architect. I design it. Someone else builds it. That's a big so, if. And in fact, yeah. uh, what I meant is you are the architect yes, for yes. it. How did that come to be? Um, it's sort of a long story. Everything is built on something else. Architecture is really evolution. I worked for SOM, a very large firm in Chicago for Skidmore, 18 years. Owens, and Merrill. Correct. I like that last name, Merrill. Yeah. Merrill. <laughs> it's a famous, uh, for the benefit yeah. of our, our friends yeah. here in, uh, in the mainland, mm -hmm. uh, it's enormously famous yes. and, and respected. They did the Sears right. Tower, the John Hancock building, and we did a lot of really tall buildings. We did the Zafang Tower, and when we were designing that, it didn't dawn on me that it would be in the top 10. We just never thought about it as being a tall building. We thought about it as being a good building, and we did everything we could to make it a better project. And about the same time, a competition came in for the Burj Khalifa, and the client said, oh, well, I want to do the world's tallest building, and it's one of those things that you hear, and someone says, yeah, I believe you, but when you get your first cost, you then back away from it, because these are incredibly expensive buildings. So the Burj came in, and that's SOM Dubai. started doing that's, that. That's, yeah, the, that's, that's the huge one in Dubai. And Mohammed Alabar, I thought, was very smart, because he wanted to build a building not for ego, but for financial reasons, where they, their performer was to lose money on the building and then sell 30 to 40,000 residential units around it. So they mark a place in Dubai. Everybody knows Dubai as being the world's tallest building today. So that was his business model. That's why he built it, not just to build the tallest building in Did the world. Did it work? It worked beautifully, and he hit the market beautifully. So the building itself was really a lost leader. <laughs> well, no, it was planned as a lost leader, but what happened was they sold out in three days. They built a marketing center, and the Burj Khalifa is mostly residential. It was about 1,000 residential units, and then some super luxury units on top. So the idea about doing big buildings is about big amounts of money and making good profit and improving the quality of life in the city. So the lessons we learned on the Burj and the Zafeng Tower are incorporated into the Shanghai Tower. So it's an evolution of a process, not just it came about because you happen to be in the right place at the right time. Marshall has worked on three of the 10 tallest buildings in the world the Burj in Dubai, the Zifeng Tower in Nanjing, and now the Shanghai Tower. On the Burj in the Zifeng Tower, Marshall was the studio head of SOM, working under the supervision of Adrian Smith. Most architects know everything about a building that's five or 10 stories, but once it starts getting above 70 stories, everything starts to change radically. What did you learn because oh. um, the, the learning curve must be um, extraordinary yes. uh, when you are doing the world's tallest building. Uh, and first of all, it's never been done before, so everybody's a little nervous. 
can we really make this work? And there's all kinds of very weird things that happen with a tall building. And there's one called stack effect. Stack, S-T-A-C-K. Stack stack. Correct. Stack. What does that mean? And it basically means a pressure differential between the top of the building and the bottom of the building. If, if say, it's um, 20 degrees outside, and it's 25 degrees in the building, you don't feel it. But if it's zero degrees outside and it's 20 degrees in the building, what you get is you get this warm column of air. And what does warm air want to do? It wants to rise. So it creates a vacuum at the bottom of the building. And it's a very powerful vacuum in a tall building. And in summer, it's the reverse. You have a cold column of air where the air inside the building is colder than it is outside the building. And that air wants to drop. And what it does is it pushes air out the bottom. And this is a lot of force. So, so you were uh, already, I have visions yeah. of, of hurricanes and, and uh, tornadoes. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, that kind of, uh, is it? Well, that's the second thing. This is more of a, a life safety issue because if you have too much pressure, you can't open the door. If you can't open the door, you can't leave the building. So you have to find ways to mitigate these unusual circumstances. The second is wind. Wind engineering for tall buildings sort of drives everything because you get typhoons that come through Shanghai. You get typhoons that come through uh, Taipei, where Taipei 101 is. And you have to resist that wind load. And that is where all the money is spent because those forces of nature are incredible. A typhoon could get up, up to 53 meters a second in wind forces on the building, and it could come from any direction. So that's what you're fighting against, these really massive forces of nature that gets translated into structure, that gets translated into money. So what you're always trying to do is find a way to make the building unaerodynamic. You've flown on a plane, right? Yes. And if you took those wings of the plane and you twisted them, the plane would never fly. The wings are designed to lift the plane. So the Shanghai Tower is an evolution of a couple of ideas. One about making the building asymmetrical, one about letting the shape of the building reduce the effects of the wind. So the whole idea comes from sort of this performance design method that we practice. There's always two things going on. If you could do two things and you could make it aesthetic and make it performance, then it gets built. Being an architect of a super tall building is very specialized. Marshall is treating the Shanghai Tower Project almost like a symphony. That is, it's not alone. It has two brothers, the Jin Mao and the Shanghai World Financial Center. If you step back to like 1985, the three buildings in Lu Jiazui were planned as part of a bigger master plan. So we always knew there was going to be three super tall buildings here. That was sort of the design of the area. The first was Jin Mao, then WFC, the Mori Tower, and then the third one is the Shanghai Tower. And I think what Shanghai is doing is sort of finishing that master plan and creating a skyline that is recognizable around the world. The Pearl Tower has a very strong presence on the skyline. And the Pearl Tower with Jin Mao, WFC, and Shanghai Tower will create an incredibly beautiful skyline. And uh, Chairman Kong always asks us to think about the three buildings as a composition of three, not your building, his building, and their building. Try to make it somewhat harmonized between the two, between the three of them. And I like to think of Jin Mao, it's a tall building that represents China's past. I, I worked for Adrian Smith for 18 years and he was the designer of that building. It's a Western architect taking a style of China and turning it into a skyscraper. Uh, the Mori building represents China's present, which is the uh, adoption of foreign investment, foreign people coming here, investing, building, working. And the Shanghai Tower we call China's future, which is a very transparent building it's a double skin building that actually acts like a shirt that you could take off or put on depending on what the weather is. Now we have to talk about what a double skin building means. I vaguely know it's ecologically correct. It's sort of like a thermos bottle. Exactly, is like a right? thermos bottle. Okay. It keeps your soup hot in the winter and it keeps your juice cool in the summer. And it's economical. Uh, it's, it is economical, but it's a long-term payback. It costs more money to build up front, but after about 10 years, it starts paying back in spades. And you have to look at the owner, and the reason why it's done not so often is owners want a return on their investment in five years. We're gonna build a building, it takes five years, we build it, we sell it, we make our money back and some profit. The Shanghai Tower is built by the Chinese government 
they're going to manage this building for the next 50 years. So they don't need to get a return on their investment in five years, they want a return on their investment over 50 years. And once you get to that state, you can actually do incredible things with energy and saving energy and not impacting the planet. Anything you could do to make someone's environment more healthy, they feel it. They may not say they feel it, but they do feel it. In Shanghai, every building's trying to be iconic, and therefore no one really is. It's like a, like a room full of people screaming. The quiet one is the one you listen to. How does it change the experience of um, someone who goes into um, something like the, the yeah. Shanghai Tower? Will they actually have a sense that this is a green building? Will it feel any different? No, it, it'll just feel... Actually, it should feel a lot different. Really? Because uh, some of the problems with buildings in large office buildings, mm -hmm. if you sit too close to the window in the winter, you're cold. If you sit too close to the core in the winter, you're too hot. And things like that happen. The Shanghai Tower, because you have this thermos skin, we can actually regulate the temperature much more even so people are more comfortable. We can actually regulate the airflow so we have healthier air. And the double skin is separated from the internal skin by about 12 meters at these atrium floors. And the atrium floors we call amenity floors where we'll have um, restaurants and meeting rooms and cafes, canteens, and all kinds of places for people to go. Because what the most sustainable thing you could do is not spending the energy in the first place. So if you go to the 90th floor, you want to go to lunch, you have to go to the first floor, and then you go to a restaurant, you come back, you go back to the 90th floor. If we could eliminate that trip from the 90th floor back to the ground floor, we've saved a great deal of energy. We just don't use it. So what we're putting is, is canteens on these amenity floors. So if we can get 5% of the office population to have lunch on the amenity floor rather than go down to the bottom, we save a million elevator trips a year. That's a substantial amount of energy that would go into a building if you didn't do this. So people will see the benefits of it. I love hearing these kinds of statistics. Oh. It fascinates me. No, no. It, I, I got too many of them. Well, no, no. I, I really find it interesting because anyone who's, who's watching no. this show um, who knows there's always that rush in a big building with everyone yeah. trying to get out of, in and out of the elevators during mm -hmm. lunchtime and trying to get back to work. Yeah. So, I mean, they can, they can relate to something like this. Well, here's one for you I think is kind of fascinating. The, the tallest building in Shanghai its elevator system, except for the fire elevators and the freight elevators, only stop at less than eight floors. Why is that? Just the way we've designed the elevator system to make it very efficient to move people through it. Usually you have 20, 30 stops on one elevator. Here in the Shanghai Tower, you have express elevators that go from the lobby to the amenity floor, and then you transfer and you take a local. So there's less than eight stops in any elevator. There's 124 floors. You're mm -hmm. saying at any given time you will get into an elevator and not have to be in there any more than eight floors. Yeah without getting out and yeah. transferring. I mean, you've it. done that in an elevator where you push the button, someone comes in and pushes 10 buttons, and then you have to stop 10, 20 times before you get to your floor. It's really quite maddening. So in eight floors, the chances of you stopping at all eight are very slim. Maybe you stop at two or three. So it actually makes people feel a little bit better. You, I, you said something about the quality of air. Yes. Uh, people would notice it. Explain Plants it. actually clean the air. If you have live foliage. That's live. <laughs> It, it actually filters the air, and so on, on our amenity floors, we, we are planting trees and landscape that will actually help oxygenate the atrium floors. So anything you could do to make someone's environment more healthy, they feel it. They may not say they feel it, but they do feel it. Because I sort of grew up with buildings where you had to know someone in the corner office to get that magnificent view. The Shanghai Tower is a building about the people more than the guy in the corner office that is spending a million dollars. How does that it. manifest? Because on these amenity floors, you could go out and you could take in the view from the eighth floor, from the uh, 20th floor, from you the 30th floor. You could walk bar. outside. No, you could walk out to the edge and see in these atriums that you can see out of Shanghai and you could walk around the atrium floor and get out and see those magnificent views. Break down um, who's going to be in those buildings in terms of what percent are uh, restaurants, what percent are uh, retail space, mm -hmm. what percent are office buildings. Are there any apartments going to be? No, it's at, if I start at the top, at, at the very top, there's a, something called a tune mass damper. And that helps the performance of the building in high wind so you don't feel the building move. It's just for comfort. 
And then you have an observation deck that's outside. And then you have a restaurant, and then you have two observation floors. Then you have a hotel. And the hotel's lobby will be at 100, the 101st floor, which will be higher than the top of the WFC. Our hotel will be higher than the WFC's observation level. And then we have a 25 meter pool on the 83rd floor. So the hotel goes below the observation to the 83rd floor. And then it's office down to about level eight. So we have a 230, 240,000 square meters of office. And then from level five down to the ground, we have a retail podium. And the path of the retail is dedicated to the subway. So people get off the subway and walk through a path up to the lobby of the building. So the subway comes right up to the door. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So What about parking? We have 1,800 cars in the uh, basement. So how many floors sub five, garage? Five, Four. five uh, floors. Those are, those, that's a garage yeah. center. And B2 is where we could cross over to the subway. And there's a link to the subway in the new IFC building. So people don't even have to go outside, say it's a rainy day, you don't have to get wet and you could walk into the Shanghai Tower from the subway. That's if you that, wanted to, you could go right bus. up and you could cross and you could be out in the sunlight. So we're not dictating. It's literally a one-stop yeah. lifestyle in, in the sense yeah. of working. Not, but, it, but it would be really, really good to have service apartments or residential apartments in this building. If you, if you could do an office building and residential on top of each other, John Hancock in Chicago is this way, you, you can actually reduce the amount of energy that you use but and you can reduce the be. impact. This isn't no, you can't because China can't put residential and commercial in the same building because of the leasehold agreements. Land is leasehold commercial for 50 years and residential for 75 years, I think. Oh, I see. So th there's, there's a legal ownership that changes that. But it's a very green thing to do. I would, you know, if anyone in the, the Chinese policy making bureau could somehow get around that, that's a good thing to do for green buildings. <laughs> do you have any idea, mm -hmm. or, is, or is it too soon to ask you something mm -hmm. like this? Um, if they are selling that space already and what... I think so. Uh, typically with these kind of buildings, uh, the Empire State Building, uh, the Sears Tower, the John Hancock uh, in KLCC, they, they tend to attract a lot of small tenants because a small firm of 30 or 40 people, they want an address. Oh, I'm in the Shanghai Tower. I only take half a floor there. But I have an address, everybody knows where it is. That's it the value. It has a lot about it. It, yeah. it. it has a branding. As a new symbol of the city, the Shanghai Tower attracts many small firms to work on it. The bit of it was also one of the most coveted in the world. All of the 10 or so major international firms were invited to compete. Finally, in 2006, Gansler won the competition, and Marshall was appointed the director of design for this firm. What goes into winning a competition? Um, uh, for instance, uh, specifically, let's talk about uh, the Shanghai Tower, because mm -hmm. clearly that was an enormously desirable contract for any firm anywhere in the world to get. Yeah. On, on the one that you did for the Shanghai Tower, yeah. um, you, you do a, a mock-up of it, yes. a mock-up as well as all yeah, the... Yeah, you do renderings and models and mm -hmm. drawings of plans and all that. You put together a tender document that engineers could review that was a detailed enough book to support the design. Now, so, in your case, um, the Chinese government came to you. I was, I was the director of design for Gensler. They hired me from, recruited me away from SOM and promised me I wouldn't have to fly around the world. And then six weeks into it, they said, would you go to Shanghai? <laughs> so it was the same old thing in a different package. And uh, they used my experience on the Burj Khalifa and the Zaifeng to get on the list to do this job. And so we went in and met with the client. And they said, we're going to do the world's tallest building. And I said, no, you're not. And they said, what do you mean? I said, well, there's this little one in Dubai that is under construction. And, and it, you're it, not even close to it. This is here in yeah. Shanghai. This is yeah, and they, and they kind of said, what do you mean? And I showed them pictures of it. And they said, OK. Okay, well, then they had to rethink. Okay, we're going to do the tallest in China. <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. They never said to you, well, guess what? We want to do the world's tallest building. No, so I think it's a, it's a more rational way of doing it. Well, at the time, they thought they were going to be the tallest building. And the Burj hadn't announced how tall it was, and the foundations were poured, and it was underway. I finished the working drawings in about uh, 2006. But you knew how tall it was going to be? Yeah. Because you... Yeah a party to it. Yes. So was that secret information? I mean, was that not supposed to be disclosed? And yeah, yeah. It was supposed to be secret. And 
Um, everybody had a different opinion of what it was, but everybody working on it. It wasn't so important how tall it was. It was more important, again, the quality of the work. So when you, th when you told um, your clients here yeah. in China, well, guess what? The Dubai is already this tall. Yeah. Uh, didn't phase them in a bit. They but said, did, okay. did you ever say? Did, did you say to them, "Well, um, what do you want to do? I mean, you want to go we, we higher?" Talk, we, we actually, we actually talked about doing something about 880 meters at that point, but that didn't last very long, because Dubai at that time was about 808, and it finally ended up being 828. So we could do 880 and significantly be taller than it, but it just didn't look right in the city of Shanghai. It, it was too tall for Shanghai, so. I have to give the planning department credit for actually not wanting to say, let's just be the tallest, let's do what's right for Shanghai. And they had planned the buildings around 580, 650 in that, in that zone. What did they say to you in terms of design? Uh, did, did they say to you, um, you, you said obviously this, mm -hmm. this, this, this is going to be a landmark building. It, it already, mm -hmm. it's not even finished and it, yes, it's no, no, that, that, that mm -hmm. goes without saying. But did they say to you, uh, we want to, even though it, we want it to represent uh, the future, and, and China is the future, mm -hmm. yet they said we want an aesthetic quality, we want it to look, well, you understand. Modern, yeah, the, their, their criteria at the beginning was modern. It had to be a modern building, it has to be iconic, and I'm still kind of unsure what iconic means. I was just going to ask you. I have but no what's clue, what's I'm, I'm sorry, I looked it up in the dictionary and, you know, something that's iconic is like the CCTV building in Beijing. You say that building, everybody knows what it is because of its shape. It's very iconic. It's not the tallest building in Beijing, but it is very iconic. It's very clearly recognizable, recognizable and memorable. Um, the Burj Khalifa, because it's so much taller than everything else around it, it, when you see it in Dubai, it dwarfs everything. And it's iconic because of its height. It's iconic because of the setbacks. Um, but what is iconic in Lu Zui? In Shanghai, every building's trying to be iconic and therefore no one really is. It's like a, like a room full of people screaming. The quiet one is the one you listen to. What I like to say to people that want to build these kind of buildings, don't build the tallest, build the best. Because you'll be around a lot longer as something that is special, that has the right proportion for the buildings around it, and not just be the tallest. Because someone's gonna come along and beat you. This is the world-famous American architect, Marshall Stribala. He's worked on three of the ten tallest buildings in the world. The Burj in Dubai, the Zifeng Tower in Nanjing, and now the Shanghai Tower. He's the chief architect of the Shanghai Tower, and when it's finished in 2014, it will be the tallest building in China, and one of the tallest buildings in the whole world. But let's, let's go back to the fact that this will be, when it's finished, and is it on schedule? Yeah. About 2014? Yeah, uh, to, uh, third quarter 2014. Okay, yeah. so it's, it's on schedule. Yeah. When you complete the tower here in Fudong, mm -hmm. it will be the tallest building- In China. In China. And the second tallest in the world. After Dubai. After Dubai. Okay. How long will it have that title of second? I mean, are there other ones um, in, in, yes, in the world? Yes, there, there are, there are. There's, there's one specific one in Shenzhen for an insurance company, and it will be 10 meters taller than the Shanghai Tower. And it will have a, a little spire that's a little bit taller. Um, the Burj Khalifa is 828 meters, a little over half a mile. The Shanghai Tower is 632, and the Ping An insurance in Shenzhen will be about uh, 640, give or take, a few meters. You, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting to me because I think of buildings um, and sort of the competitive mm -hmm. nature of cities against yeah. one another in the United States because I've lived in Boston with the mm -hmm. Hancock Tower and I've lived in Chicago, so I, of course I know the Sears Tower. And it's always one who has to get a little bit taller than the other. And to my mind, yeah. some are kind of cheating. Yes. Cheating in the sense that they build very tall buildings, but when you get really at the top, they'll put it gets really, really narrow. Nobody yes. really goes up there. There's yeah. a beacon light or something. Yeah. And then, as you say, <laughs> they do some pointed yeah. structure. A spire. And they say, guess what? Guess what? I'm, I'm, half, I'm taller than you. I'm taller than you. Yes. So is there some criteria? Yeah. Um, 
in terms of measuring what is really legitimately the tallest or second tallest? There, there's a group called the Council of Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat that is self-appointed regulator of what is a tall building. Uh, you've seen the Sears Tower. Yes. And what's on top of the Sears Tower? These two big antennas. Those don't count against the height of the Sears Tower. They're not counting on They're not counting because they're antennas. Antennas do not count against height. And you've seen the Petronas Towers in Kuala Lumpur. They have sort of this little spire on top of it. They don't count either. They count because it, it's not an antenna. It's an architectural feature. Oh, that's still cheating. I mean, I think that's cheating. Well, uh, there's I, I'm three talking criteria. about really yeah. building, building. There's the highest architecture feature. Mm -hmm. The second one, I think, is the highest occupied floor and or roof. And those three criteria, the Burj has the undisputed title of being the tallest. Which the is highest it? architecture feature, the highest roof, the highest occupied floor. I, I would go with the highest occupied floor because yeah. to me that's... Publicly occupied floor. Okay. Because you can actually climb up to the top, very tippy top of the Burj, but the public really can't go up there. So the Burj, I think the highest occupied floor in there is around 600 meters. And the highest occupied floor in the Shanghai Tower is about 570. And the observation deck of the Shanghai Tower is uh, 540. On All right, but, but, but the 100 meters taller than the observation deck of Burj. So th this game you're talking about, is someone cheating with the height of their building? Yes, I kind of think they are. Because if you look at them, in, in, in our office, we have a model of the Burj, and we have a model of the Shanghai Tower. And when they came to the office, I thought we made a mistake because I know how tall the Burj is, and when I saw the two buildings next to each other, I thought there was a mistake. Why? Because the Burj gets so thin at the top, it, it doesn't kind of hold its own. Where well, the Shanghai Tower goes to 632, but it's a large enough floor to actually occupy near the top. It, it's sort of an optical illusion. But if you saw the two buildings next to each other, you kind of look at them and say, yeah, they're about the same size, same height, but one is 300 meters taller than the other. But the other Six sounds to me like a more sturdy uh, well, structure. I don't mean sturdy. No, I'll like, take that back. Yeah. I'll be in such trouble if I say sturdy. No, they're all uh, but they're you know, incredibly you sturdy. Uh, but you uh, understand. Solid what? or it, it has a presence. Solid, yes. presence. Uh -huh. And uh, what I like to say to people that want to build these kind of buildings, don't build the tallest, build the best. Because you'll be around a lot longer as something that is special that has the right proportion for the buildings around it and not just be the tallest. Because someone's gonna come along and beat you. And then you have someone like the Empire State Building that was the tallest building for the longest time. And I believe Taipei 101 was the tallest building for the shortest amount of time. <laughs> There's so all sorts of it categories. Was the, yeah, it was it's the tallest a, building. It sounds like so. the Academy Awards or, yeah, or, or like, something um, like it. Now, award for the semi-tallest building on Thursday afternoon in a windstorm. If you look at the buildings, which are higher than 400 meters, you'll find that there are only about 15... ...in the world. There's a saying, a tall tree catches the wind. And super tall buildings are fascinating. But they also have their critics. You know, I was interviewing mm -hmm. you. Uh, so many people, everybody has a question for you. Oh. Uh, it, why, well, the obvious, why, do you, why does anyone want to build anything that big? I mean, that tall. Yeah. Uh, particularly uh, on a very somber note, in, in, in light of the fact that you had the world trade towers go down, you yes. know, with the terrorist attack in 9-11, mm -hmm. just by the very fact that, that when the terrorists decide which building, they go for the... the the biggest one, the tallest yeah. one. And so one wonders in the future if anyone no. even wants to be, I mean, that's a very logical question. Do you really want to be after 9-11? And you've, you've certainly had those questions asked of you. Very much so, and, and it's, it's a very valid question. One, what happened in September 11 changed how we build buildings. The robustness of the way we build buildings today, the cores and the structure are much more robust than they were. The safety of getting people out of the building faster is better. So the lessons we've learned from that is, can we save more lives by getting people out faster, by using elevator evacuation, 
uh, the Twin Towers did not have a concrete core. They basically had a steel core that would separate fire, but it wasn't a very robust system. If that core was a concrete core, the towers may have lasted another hour or two and more people would have gotten out. Why was that so? I mean, um, was that just, it, the, was it, it that just the, the state coast. of the art at the it time was. and that seemed like as is, is good as it was going to ever get and logical and... It made perfect sense and it met all codes in New York at the time it was built. Um, there was a building that actually hit the Empire State Building, uh, an old plane in the 30s or 40s, I can't remember, and the building withstood it. But no one really thought about, well, gee, we have to plan for a jet full of jet fuel running into a building and becoming a ball of flame. That was something no one ever designed a building to prevent. Do we do that today? Um, more or less. The, the Shanghai Tower is so robust, if the core is so robust, the structure is so robust, I don't think you'd have the same catastrophic failure. The Burj Khalifa, I think, is even more robust because it's a residential building. We have a lot more structure supporting it. But right after September 11th, everybody said, no, we're not building tall buildings, and everything sort of dropped, and we're going to be low and quiet, and just like you said. We, we can't live in the shadow of, of a few people that are, let's say, less than sane. And there's always going to be someone trying to attack one group or another group. And buildings are symbols of cities and countries, and that's why they would get attacked. The other thing that, that this is just a very, um, mm -hmm. a question from a layperson yeah. such as myself. You were, I have a great appreciation for typhoons mm -hmm. um, since I moved to Shanghai yes. and I've lived here. Not, not that thankfully it's never mm -hmm. been hit, but you know, all you have to do is turn on the news and see where which one is going to come yes. uh, to Taiwan, mm -hmm. or if it's going to hit South Korea, or if it's going to hit Japan. And, uh, but a typhoon is really just um, a hurricane to, it, by any other name. Yeah. I mean, isn't it? So it's, so it's the same. Well, we use hurricane the, in the Atlantic and typhoon in the Pacific. The same, it's the same, same force of nature, yes. Same force. Is that the most frightening thing for, for a tall building, for yes. For a tall building, not a tornado. Yeah. Not a tornado. I don't know the forces in a tornado, but in a typhoon or a hurricane, yes, that's absolutely the peak load that you need to manage. Now, when you build this, you, you take into effect, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm sure you work on fast. Fascinated with the teams you must have. I mean, you must have all sorts of experts on, on uh, well, on the weather alone. On wind I mean, engineering, yes. And wind engineering, and that's just, yes. just one of them. So clearly, you must sit down with them and say, okay, what is the highest winds that have ever, mm -hmm. ever been uh, recorded, recorded yes. uh, anywhere in the world? Mm -hmm. uh, and what are they? And then within that structure, they give you a number and you work to that, yes. but then you're also so working with more than that. Yes. Uh, that is the word case mm -hmm. scenario. Exactly. How do you come up with that number for worst case scenario? You actually test for it. You, you don't guess. Uh, there's wind tunnel testing where we actually build scale models of the building. And we test it in wind conditions from all angles so we can determine what those are going to be. We change the shape of the building to actually mitigate some of those forces. The wind Wind tunnel is this big room that blows wind and you put a scale model in it with the context and the, the models rotate and they have sensors for pressure and force balance tests. And we even did one in Ottawa where we had a eight meter tall 
scale model of the Shanghai Tower with Jin Mao and WFC. We call the three brothers here in yeah. Shanghai. You're the biggest brother here. Your building mm -hmm. will be the biggest, and then the two little yeah, brothers. Yeah, and uh, a friend of mine who's an engineer who worked on Jin Mao, he said, well, when you build your building, it's going to... put more force on our building, but we've already accounted for that. So they already have. Yeah, we, we've already known. These, these are scientists that are incredibly smart people that know what they're doing. I call them the adult supervision. You know, the architecture world. Printmaking was my most fun. I really enjoyed that. And I met a girl who wanted to be an architect, and I sort of wanted to be with her, so I kind of went along with her dream to be an architect, and we applied back east to graduate school. I got into graduate school, and she didn't. She mean. In the past, um, I, I've had mm. a lot of friends, actually, who are architects, yes. and I've interviewed a lot of architects. I think it must be very, very difficult and mm -hmm. painful to some extent to really, truly be an architect, because on the mm. one yeah. hand, you're an artist, mm -hmm. and on the other hand, you're an engineer. Yeah. And it's like oil and water. You want no, the no, creative. No, it's not. It's not oil and water. It's finding the right balance between science and art. Too much art is decadent, too much science is dead. You need to find that balance that is aesthetically wonderful, but scientifically supported. Is that what drives you? Is that yes. what fascinates you, is taking that and, and yes. making it work? I'm driven by discovery than preconceived ideas. And if I knew what the building looked like before it was finished, it would be a really boring existence. And I can't believe anyone actually knows what the building's gonna look like before it's finished. Which brings me to mm -hmm. the fact, if, if, if our audience, we have a mm -hmm. very young audience, always want to know about our guests' personal life. They want to know their trajectory. So if you'd be kind enough, take oh, me sure, back. Sure. I mean, you're a California kid. Yes, I grew up in near San Francisco. Are your parents, were they well, artists, engineers? My, my father is a very interesting man, and he's a patent attorney. So I grew up doing patent drawings, and... I could do a measured drawing and read a measured drawing and build something to a set of plans. So he taught me that. Yeah, but you had to have a, a given talent for well, drawing. I've always loved to draw. I draw on everything. You paint? I used to, not, not so much anymore. Very abstractly, but drawing, I, I did cartoons. I, I was fired from a job when I was a kid because I did this one cartoon I loved. It was a computer. This is when computers were really big. and. I mounted a computer on the wall in a bathroom, and the caption was input output. And they thought it was too risque, and I just. It is a little you know. risque. But this, this was uh, 1981, 82. Your dad was a patent attorney. Yeah, he was attorney. a patent attorney, so what he taught a, me how to draw. What about your mom? Where did you get this, this aesthetic? Um, actually, I taught my mom to draw. She went back to school when I was in high school in apparel design, and she teaches uh, construction of clothing and design. My mom has a very good eye, but she never thought of herself as a designer. She thought of herself more as a technician. I think my mom signed me up to go to UCLA, drove me down there, left me on the curb and said, go to school, learn something, kid. Uh, what happened? So I went to UCLA. What were you majoring? I was majoring in art. I ended up with a degree in design. I took classes in uh, glass blowing, ceramics, printmaking. Printmaking was my most fun. I, I really enjoyed that. And uh, design. What happened so, when you graduated? Well, I, I met a girl who wanted to be an architect, and I sort of wanted to be with her, so I kind of went along with her dream to be an architect, and we applied back east to graduate school in architecture. I thought, yeah, architecture seems like a good profession. Anything for love. You yeah, pretty much, pretty much. Mm -hmm. And I got into graduate school, and she didn't. Now, you're married now. Is, yes. is your wife, does she have, I'm always fascinated about who one marries, and, and, and if you're opposites, or if you're uh, alike. Uh, Joan, I, I met Joan. Joan and I've been married for about twelve years, and very, very smart woman. And it took me about five years to get her to the.
point where I would show her something I'm doing. Well, Joan, what do you think of this building? And she said, oh, it's so wonderful, Marshall, so wonderful. I said, no, I don't want that. I want you to honestly say you like it or you don't. And I don't even need to know why. But she sort of picked up on that. So she's, I think, my best critic. Because she's not an architect, she can look at a building and say, God, I don't get it. It looks, why are you doing that? And to me, that's a great deal of knowledge that sometimes you don't have because you're too close to something. Like your own children could do no wrong. Someone has to come in and say, ah, your kids are you know, screwing up at school. Maybe you should do something about it. And your so, wife so will that, tell oh, you. Yeah, she will. She's not a yes man. No, she is, <laughs> she, she's her own person, in fact. We have to reel her in a lot. She's out there on her own doing all kinds of crazy things. But it's great now. She gets to commute, and I get to stay in Shanghai. Tell me about what your life is like, because you, you, you're a, a world-class mm -hmm. um, architect, and indeed, you have been all over the world, and yeah. you've had projects all over the world. Do you have homes all over the world? Yes, I do. I, um, I live in Texas, Houston, Texas. We have a loft downtown. My wife and I still have a home in Chicago, and uh, we have a home in Shanghai. So I spend most of my time in Shanghai. I There are these wonderful pockets where you could spend your uh, home work life and you could walk, I can walk to work in 10 minutes, I can walk home. I don't need to get in a car, I don't need to take a taxi. That's part of being green, is not using that energy to travel two hours in a car to go to your place of business. Architect who has a very specialized background, Marshall not only designed Designs super tall buildings, he does other types of buildings. He did the LG Art in Seoul and the Convention and Exhibition Center in Hong Kong. You do a lot of convention centers. Yes. It, it, it just strikes me. You do enormously tall buildings. Or it's enormously long buildings. Yeah, I mean, what other kinds of buildings have you done that you really enjoy? The Houston Ballet was 10,000 square meters, six stories, and I loved every minute of it. Great client, uh, just the budget was really low, but that didn't matter. We, we put together a fantastic building. They loved their building. What did you like about it? You know, it was just like doing something for a family that really knew what they wanted, and we found ways to make their life much better. We brought daylight into the studios, the dance studios. We looked at how much daylight to bring in so we could actually have the different walls have different tones on them because we did a lot of benchmarking. We went up to the Toronto Ballet and they had paint they had painted the walls different colors. And I said, why did you do that? And they said, because our spotting, we need to be able to see the four distinct walls and come back to where we were. And it's just what, a mechanism. You mean, you mean when the, ball when the ballerinas are spin? Like a th their heads have if to all the walls are the same that, color, they can't stop where they want to. So they need to be able to. Is that true in all yeah. ballet? Well, no, it's a, in a ballet studio. Oh, it's just the studio. In the studio oh. because, you know, you have four walls sure. and mirrors and things like that. So it was just finding out about the ballet was so fascinating for me. And I, and I just loved it. And the people were willing to tell you. And um, we, we toured the dressing rooms of uh, the principals in Toronto. And it was really funny. The women were just slobs in, in the dressing rooms. It was scary. 
And, and the men were really tidy, <laughs> trying to, to make their lives better through architecture is really fun. Because if you just say, well, we're going to do the same thing over and over again, and we did it that way on Thursday, we're going to do it that way on Friday and Saturday and Sunday, that's no fun. So everybody's different. And to learn about someone's home and do a home for someone like the Houston Ballet, you can just learn so much. Have you ever done residential homes? Um, I've done a few. I did one in Hawaii that I liked for um, two psychiatrists, and it was great. Great, because I was new when the meeting was over. They would say, we've made great progress today. <laughs> like a Yeah, but, but it was kind of funny at times because um, the wife would call me and say, don't, don't, don't tell Dave this, but this is what I want. And Dave would call me and say, don't tell Jelaine this, but this is what I want. So I was kind of the mediator in the middle of this. That's, that's, a, that's yeah. a funny story. I was thinking about an architect. because their work is gigantic. Someone yeah. like, it's not like a painting. Yours is out there. Yeah. And that comes with the good and the bad because everybody mm. can make a judgment on it. Oh yeah. And, and you make a judgment on it. And I wonder um, what, would, what it would be like for you when you live in Shanghai mm -hmm. and you're building and you're just walking along the street one day with your wife, Joan. What are the kinds of things that if you could mm -hmm. hear people talking about the Shanghai Tower um, would, would please you enormously. Oh, well, it, it's, it's kind of odd because it. as an architect, what we hear about is things that don't work. Oh, I wish we had more room there or that didn't work. You put that in the wrong place. We, we hear all the little things that we didn't do right. And I would say to, to people, once in a while, just tell us we did something right. <laughs> And I think we do 90, 95% of the things right. But it's those little nitpicky things that, you know, people remember because, uh, you know, the elevators didn't work or that didn't work or whatever. Some people love it. Some people hate it. Buildings like CCTV, no one is ambivalent about it. Everybody loves it or hates it. There is no middle ground there. Is that good? I don't know. I really don't know. I mean, all that means is it engenders a very strong yeah, reaction. Yeah, exactly. What about the other two brothers? Uh, what kind of reactions do you find that most people have about them? Because I I as a foreigner living yeah. here for the last three years, you know, I hear yeah. about them, but the one everybody talks about is the Pearl Tower. And then you have your two brothers, and now the three brothers. Yeah. And, and I always thought how lovely that cityscape is on the Pudong side. Mm -hmm. Did it strike you that way? I, I think you, you, you have the pushy side, which is turn of the century colonial buildings that are gorgeous. And then you have Lu Jiazui, which is sort of this modern that is built with futuristic skyscrapers. But I look at Jin Mao and WFC and Shanghai Tower and even the Pearl River Tower are in a way timeless. They're, they're not something you see over and over and over again. That is a really interesting idea. I think it fits very well in the city. I have no clue how to get there, but I know when I'm there. Just by looking at it. When, yeah. when you have the right proportion, the right building, you know it. But there, there's really no roadmap to get you there. You have to try a lot of things. You have to fail. You have to attempt things. But the goal is to try to come to a performance-based, aesthetically, timeless sculpture in China that does not become dated in five years. And that, that's a real tough thing to do. Well, I'm thrilled. Yeah. I'm thrilled to meet you. I'm thrilled you. that you have done this building. It'll be done on 2014 because I know um, as mm -hmm. a foreigner living here, I, I think Shanghai is simply one of the most wow. beautiful cities in the world with the Huangpu dividing it. it, it it's like a, 
a mirror, the, yeah. you know, the, the, the river, and it reflects op the juxtaposition of one side, the Pudong side, mm -hmm. against the Pushu side, I think is one of the most extraordinary uh, cityscapes mm -hmm. in, in, the, in world. the world, in the world. Yeah. And just think you've added to that. And I, I feel honored to be part of it, and I feel honored to, to be able to go to the site so often because it, it feels like, I, I think of my buildings as my children. It's, you want them to be the best they can, so you want to always be there helping them, making sure they're doing the right thing, and you're not quite willing to let them go on their own. Even when they're on their own, you're you still to, helping them out. You have to let those babies go at yeah, some oh, point. Yeah. It's been my honor oh, to have no, you. No, thank you very much. It, success. It was a fun conversation. <laughs> it really that's was. just because we both are Californians, yeah, that's this all. Is easy, yeah. and so how are you feeling these days? <laughs> how are you feeling? I, yeah. We're feeling very we're, we're good. We're feeling it. Thought. Thank you so very much. Oh, my pleasure, my pleasure.